Good evening. It's great to see you. We all know Pentecost is a big day and it's a big feast at St. Michael. The rushing wind, the tongues of fire, a cacophony of languages, a fire breather, and the adult choir all in one place with us today. Welcome back. And Pentecost isn't just a big day for Christians. Before Christians claimed it, It was a Jewish festival. Every year, 50 days after the Passover, the Jews would celebrate the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, a harvest festival. The people would bring their first fruits to the temple in Jerusalem. That's why there's so many people in the story of Acts today from different nations, because they've come bearing their fruits in thanksgiving for the first harvest. After the temple was destroyed, that observance changed a bit. But this is a Jewish festival as well as a Christian festival. But before we get carried away by what a big deal Pentecost is, I'd like us to pause for a minute, take a breath, and back up. I'd like to pay attention to all the waiting that preceded this day. For I believe it's the waiting that enabled the disciples to perceive the events of Pentecost as a gift from God in the first place. Waiting. The Bible is filled with stories of waiting. In fact, it's held up as a spiritual virtue. The Holy Spirit brooded over the formless void, waiting for that word from God. Noah waited for the rains to come, even though it made him look foolish. Moses and the people waited in the wilderness for 40 years. The prophets waited for people to repent even when they were slow to do so. And many verses in the Bible extol the importance of waiting. Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 37, 7, be still and wait for the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Proverbs 20, 22, wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. Isaiah 30, 18, the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him, for his justice. Even Jesus told the disciples to wait in the first chapter of Acts. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my, that, the, that my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. The Bible is filled with waiting, and that includes the disciples, and that includes us. But it's hard to wait. We all know that. During the pandemic, we had to wait to do all manner of things that we love to do. Sometimes, some of us wait for things that never come. You know what I'm talking about. A partner. A baby. Forgiveness. Healing. And sometimes our waiting extends beyond our time on earth, and then we wait in God. The kind of waiting I'm talking about tonight is a holy waiting, a prayerful waiting, a waiting grounded in God. It's different than that bored, annoyed, impatient waiting that we do when we scroll on our cell phones and we're really not sure what else to do, so we just keep our minds busy. It's different than waiting in line for a vaccine or waiting for your little brother to leave you alone. It's holy waiting, making room for something to be born. That's what the disciples did for all their unfaithfulness, for all their confusion. They waited. They waited faithfully and they didn't just wait. They prayed and they didn't just pray. They did it together. They waited and they prayed and they did it together. They were waiting for that gift of the Holy Spirit that they weren't quite sure what it would look like, but they knew it would reveal the truth of God and that it would empower their testimony to Jesus Christ. And so they waited. When I was a freshman in college, just before I began college, I went to Wheaton College and Wheaton has a camp called Honey Rock. Some of you have heard of this camp. And they have a wilderness survival program that some students do before they go into Wheaton. They call it High Road. If I had known what was involved in this program, I would not have done it. I'm telling you, it nearly killed me. My wife always is like, you make this sound good, but I really think it was torture. Yeah, it is. 
This program involved us, in a sense, waiting on the instructions from the leaders because we never knew what was going to happen on a given day. And my biggest shock is that I thought I was going on a hiking trip. Apparently, everyone else had got the mailer about whether they want to do mountain biking or hiking. I hadn't responded, so they put me in the mountain biking group. And it's a wonder I knew how to ride a bike. I don't know what they would have done if I couldn't. And we, for days upon days, grueling days, we would go as far as we could with our loaded panniers. We weren't allowed to be on paved road. And so we would find paths and we would bushwhack sometimes. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And then we had done that for about 10 days. And it came time, it was the end of a day. We were setting up camp. We were exhausted. And they said, give us your bikes, take these backpacks. You're now going to hike all night. Talk about being at the end of yourself. And so in the rain, we hiked without flashlights, trusting the clouds above the trees to show us where we were going. And we did that all night long until at, in the morning, we came to the shore of Lake Superior. And there they divided us about a quarter of a mile apart. They gave us a plastic tent, water, a Bible, and a journal. And we fasted for three days. You know, it's interesting when you're a young Christian, you think, well, this is going to be good. This is going to be spiritual. This is going to help my faith. But I will tell you the phases that you go through in those three days after you have already basically not had enough food, you are already exhausted. It's a spiritual kind of place, a warfare, and it wasn't easy. For me, my phases went like this of waiting, relief to stop moving, then rest, quiet, beauty, and prayer. That was kind of the spiritual part of the fast then hunger, then distraction, then irritability, then a fight with God, exhaustion, surrender, and sleep. Those were my three days. And at the conclusion of it, they broke the fast. They gave us cheese and meat. And then they said, now you're going to run a half marathon. I don't think this is medically indicated, just in case anyone <laughs> is thinking of doing this. But in that whole time, I remember those three days on Lake Superior. I remember that time by myself. And I remember the waiting and not even knowing what I was waiting for. But I knew that my leaders were inviting me into an encounter with myself, with the earth, and with God. And that it would change me. And this group that went on high road, we were a force to be reckoned with when we went on campus. Everyone else is kind of blinking and sad and saying bye to mom and dad. And we're like charging through. There was a confidence. There was an empowerment for what we had gone through together. Which brings us back to the disciples waiting in this room, waiting for the gift of God. And suddenly it's time. There's the sound of rushing wind. There's tongues of fire over their heads. There's praise of God in different languages. The glorified Christ had sent his spirit to the disciples to guide them and to keep them for the journey ahead and not just the journey ahead, but for eternity. That is the spirit that we are promised. That's the power that we are given if we claim it. And I think the most powerful expression of the Holy Spirit, which we often miss, is Peter's testimony, which comes right after this chapter. He testifies to the crucified Christ, to the very people who had crucified him. This testimony cut them to the quick. Peter could have focused on God's love. Peter could have focused on the resurrection. Peter could have focused on the glory to come, but he proclaimed Christ crucified. Foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he spoke with power. If they had conducted a feasibility study, they would have told him to avoid this topic. But he bore witness to the truth of the crucifixion. And in so doing, over 3,000 people repented and were baptized that day. Peter was not acting in his own power. Peter was acting in the power of the Holy Spirit. What are we waiting for at St. Michael? What are you waiting for? Everything to open up again? Your favorite worship service to return? Construction to begin? Our 75th anniversary guests to arrive? Perhaps. But in all of these things, we wait for the Holy Spirit. 
as church, our purpose to, is to experience the forgiveness that comes from God and to extend reconciliation to our neighbors. That is our operating system. We never know when it will happen. Maybe tonight, maybe in the fall, maybe a hundred years from now. One thing we know is that Jesus has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit and that spirit will fill us with truth and power. But the only way we will recognize the spirit is by waiting together in prayer. Because otherwise, we might miss her entirely. Amen.